definition of sensitive and here's what it is. It means quick to detect or respond. We need to be quick to detect or respond to God. Obviously, come to Him, believe that He is, and He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. But we need to be quick to detect or respond God, to God's promptings, God's leadings, or to slight changes, signals, or influences. Isn't that something? Quick to detect uh, God's promptings. This is, I'm adding my stuff here, but this is the dictionary definition. Or respond to slight changes, signals, or influences. I want to show you this from, uh, from the Amplified Bible. Romans chapter 7 and verse 6 says, But now we are discharged from the law and having terminated all intercourse with it, <laughs> having died to what once restrained and held us captive, so now we serve, not under obedience to the old code of written regulations, but under obedience to the promptings of the Spirit in newness of life. That's Romans chapter 7 verse 6 from the Amplified Bible. We live in response to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Now, I have to say this, those are always validated by the Word of God. I'm telling you, the, the, more, the Lord showed me this one time. The more Scripture we have in us, the more it empowers the Holy Spirit to guide us into that truth. Thy Word is truth, Jesus said in John 17, 17. Sanctify them through Thy Word. Thy Word is truth. He is the living Word, John 1, 1, John 1, 14. But the, the written Word, the Scriptures, uh, uh, are you know the expression of... Jesus, as the Spirit prompts us into that relationship, if that makes any sense. They don't contradict. Because some people get promptings and they're not validated in the Word of God. And we have to judge those things and we have to continue to put the Word of God in us because it, it gives... The Lord showed it to me this way. The more Scripture we have in us, it's like turning up the volume knob on the voice of God. It gives the, scripture, the Holy Spirit the raw material to, to teach us, to guide us, to protect us uh, in individual situations. But there... There are things that are not in the Scripture, like how do I deal with this situation? How do I deal with that situation? Well, there's the Scripture says, Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, that we are to let the peace of God rule in us. Let it, allow it. In other words, it should be reigning in us, and whenever there's a break in that peace, which we often refer to as a check, uh, that's when we need to be sensitive. I think of, I think it's in Acts 16, where... Paul and Silas were ministering and they were just going. They had a word from God, go into all the world and preach the gospel. They had a word and they were going. And, and as they were going to go into Asia and, uh, and the Holy Spirit forbade them, they had a check. So, well, let's go to Bithynia. I'm not sure the order here. Another check. And then they had the dream, come over to Macedonia. We need you over here. And that's what the, the Spirit of God allowed them, them to do. So it's important that we learn to be sensitive to the Spirit of God, that we learn to hear Him, that we learn... Uh, uh, to be sensitive to his promptings. Amen? Because I'm convinced, well, let me say it to you this way. We have to, willing, number one, be willing to be honest with ourselves and be willing to say, Lord, I want your leading. I want your prompt. I was praying about a situation in my life today and I said, Lord, anything in this thought, this idea, that's me, I mean, I put the whole thing on the altar. You burn up what ain't, ain't you and, and I trust him. He will show me. Amen? And as I get those promptings, sometimes you know, but you don't want to know. You know, Lord, help me to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. But anyhow, all right, you should be directed by your heart and not your brain. Boy, that's powerful. Now, that doesn't mean we check our brain at the door. All right? Our brain is a tool, but it's not to be the leader. Amen? That's important, but so many people, they, they, they allow their brain to run the show. I'm going to show you this that kind of validates this. It doesn't use the word brain, but it's, it's the principles here. In Hebrews chapter number 5, look at verses 12 through 14 in Hebrews 5. Look at this. For when the time, for, for, when, for the time you ought to be teachers. Now, this is the writer of Hebrews saying, listen, you should be teachers by now. That doesn't mean everyone's going to have a five-fold teaching ministry. No. But every servant, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, that the servant of the Lord must be apt to teach. Apt, that word apt to teach in the old King James means skillful in teaching. Every believer should come to a place where they are skillful in communicating what they believe, why they believe it, and help other people enter into that same thing. But that doesn't mean that that person's called to go in a, in a pulpit sense, but we're all called to teach in, that, in, in a believer sense, okay? And that's what he's talking about here. For when the time uh, that you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are uh, 
and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now, when you think about milk, milk is something that comes from an animal that it's been pre-prepared for you, pre-digested or whatever the processes are that produce milk. In other words, it, 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 it's broken down so you can digest it. But there comes a time when you should be able to digest some things yourself. That does, you never get to a place where you don't need teachers in the body of Christ to help you. you that doesn't, I mean, we're, we're called to, to learn from others, not to be our Holy Spirit. They're not to be our mediator, but they're called to stir up what's in us. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 20, you have an unction or anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. And so when people teach you, they're, they're confirming what's in your spirit and they're helping bring that forth. Amen. So the time, he says, you should be teachers by now, but you, you need to be taught the first principles of the oracles of God and you have become such as have need of milk. Milk has been pre-prepared for you. I mean, it, it's different. I mean, babies live on milk. Amen. But you don't give a steak to a one-year-old. At least I hope not, right? They have to grow. They have to develop into that in the natural. But It says, for everyone, verse 13 of Hebrews 5, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. There's nothing wrong with being a babe. Just don't stay a babe. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk, or the sincere, old King James says, sincere or pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And I believe there's a couple things being said there. When you're a babe, desire that sincere milk, but keep that same desire that a baby has for milk, keep that same desire for the Word, no matter how mature you are in the Lord. Amen? There's a couple things. That's 1 Peter 2, 2. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the Word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Watch verse 14. For, but strong meat belongeth to them who are of full age, mature, who by reason of use, I love this word use, it's the Greek word hexus, and the word use there, it has to do with habit. Habit. You know, it's habit. And it says, who by reason of habit have their senses exercised or trained to discern good and evil. In other words, their senses aren't leading their brain per se, and then their, and their, their senses, their five senses, their five physical senses aren't leading, but even they're trained because they're in subjection to the, to the spirit of man. They're the born-again spirit. They're in subjection. They're trained now to discern good and evil. Amen. But a lot of times people base God's leading on, on feelings, and they've never got to the place where they, where they, they they're, you know, go for the word. I can tell you this about feelings. They can be like this, or they can be like that. And, and man, you know, I like it when they're like that, but you can't live there. I love what Andrew says about when he had his uh, encounter with God, March the 23rd, 1968. He said, I forget six months or however long it went. He said, and then it left. He thought, what did I do, Lord? What did I do? Like, God doesn't want you living that way. You can't live that way. You can't live that way in a relationship. You can't live that way in a marriage. You can't live that way uh, in a job. Churches, people do that all the time. And then once the newness wears off. The Bible says we're to walk in the newness of spirit and, and we're to serve in the newness of spirit. Romans chapter 6 and Romans 7 says that. We're, and, and, and the newness is the, is the freshness. There's always a freshness in the spirit, but you just it's not like living on a high. You know, Pro, uh, Proverbs 17, 24 says, Wisdom is right before him that has understanding, but the eyes of the fool are in the ends of the earth. You know what that means? They're always looking out there for what's available to them right where they're at, geographically. Amen? It's not out there. It's right here because God's here and I'm here. We're waiting to get to some level, whatever that level is. And then we don't even know what it is. And then when we get there, if you don't know what it is, how are you going to know when you get there? You're not. And see, and that's, that's a delusional thing. That's why the Bible says godliness in 1 Timothy chapter 6 says godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment without godliness is complacency. And that's not what we're talking about. Passivity. But godliness, which is mean, it's an internal devotion to God, it's being well devoted to God. Godliness with contentment is great gain. God wants you to gain in every area. Amen. Praise God. I've been meditating somewhat on when God, in, in Genesis 32, I believe it's verse 28, somewhere around there, where God changes Jacob's name into Israel. And Israel, there's, depending on where you look, but I've looked at this and I believe this is accurate. Uh, uh, Jacob, you know, means supplanter, healer, cheater, which is what people are, can be at some varying levels. <laughs> but it, but it, that's the heart. It's it, outside of Christ. But when he had his encounter with God, you know the story. He limped. But it, it, if you in uh, 
Brown Driver Briggs, it says it means God prevails. Or I have one expositor say it means one whom God has conquered. I think that's powerful. And I, and I see that in my own life. I, look back, I was even thinking today, like looking back at my Christian walk and all the times I thought I knew this and knew that. And I'm thinking, Lord, thank you for mercy, you know, because now I just realize that, man, any good thing is him. And I'm excited to be in a position just to serve. It's exciting. It's freedom. It's liberty. You don't have to be nothing because he's everything. And when he's everything, he'll, he'll take nobodies and make them somebodies. That's just how he is. But if you still think you're somebody, you know, he can't take a somebody and make him somebody because until they become a nobody. And then when they're a nobody, he can take a nobody and make them a somebody if they'll put their faith in him. I know. Peter Piper picked it. <laughs> All right. All right. So, uh, so we should be directed by our heart, not our brain. Like I said, we don't check our brain out, but, but, it, but it's, we serve. We allow it to serve, not lead. This I say, therefore, Ephesians 4, 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk, talking about our walk, believers walk, not as the other Gentiles walk. How do they walk? In the vanity of their mind. That's a fascinating phrase. Vanity of their mind. Their, their thinking, their mental faculties. I call it mental lordship. The vanity of their mental lordship. Go here, if you would, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 verse I absolutely love. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and look at verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. Now think about this. Talking to Christians, 1 Corinthians 3.18, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul says, let no man or woman deceive himself. If any man comes on, uh, or any man among you seems to be wise in this age, this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Isn't that amazing? In other words, if I think I got it going on, he said, let me become a fool. And that's not in, in a negative sense, but it's, it has to do, like Paul said in Philippians 3, all the things that I thought were so great, I counted them as dung, that I may win Christ. That's what he's saying. But it says, don't deceive yourself by thinking you're all that. I think of people, and I think of people that even hurt other people intentionally and all that stuff, and some of these people you see on the news and stuff, and they literally think, that there's no retribution. They do. They think they're pretty good people. That's called deception. They're deceived to the max. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are fully set to do evil. Ecclesiastes 8.11. And it says, though they do evil a hundred times, they seem to get away with it. It's not how it is. You see, that's, that's, we think this vapor of a life is so long. It's not. It's short. It's short. Amen? Boy, I got so much to say on that. I, wanna, I got a message that's kind of brewing in me about, uh, I want to talk about physical death. You don't have to be afraid of physical death. In fact, you can look forward to it. You don't want to go home early. You want to finish your course. But man, this is our hope, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, Colossians 1. Where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which means the gospel unadulterated. It says we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. The context of that is talking about eternity and your glorified body. That's what it's talking about. It applies every area. But man, you believe God for healing. Like Andrew says, you get healed. You rub the devil's nose in it. You don't get healed. You, you, you go home and be with the Lord. It's a win-win situation. But let's get this thing in perspective. Let's get this thing in perspective. Let's stop, you know, the Bible, <laughs> I got so many verses, but 1 Corinthians 15, 19, talking about uh, the resurrected body. Verse 19 says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. You don't hear that preached too much. And it doesn't say we don't have any hopes in this life. It says only. I mean, if we're trying to draw out of this life, uh, you know, like I was thinking, thinking about it today, like, some cool house in the wilderness and just this be a boy someday I'm going to get there. That ain't my hope. I don't want to be out there. There's nobody out there to minister to, you know, but, but I, it's pretty and I appreciate it. But listen, uh, my hope isn't this world. Hallelujah. That's why Paul was like, that's why he could endure the persecution. Amen. So many Christians, we live like they're like, it's just this life. It isn't this life. What you sow for eternity is going to last forever. Those, it says in Daniel chapter 12, I believe around verse 3, it says, those that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. Isn't that awesome? That's powerful. You say, well, I'm not a big minister. I'm not this. I'm not that. Just be what you are where you're at and let God do it. 
when Jesus separates in Matthew 25, they separate the sheep and the goats, you know it. It's interesting that the, the sheep, both of them say, Lord, when did we do these things? And he said, whenever you did it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Notice he didn't say goats. If you'd have just acted like these sheep, things would have been cool. These were two different animals. And the goats say, when did we not do this? And they'll say, when you did not do it to one of the least, you, didn't, you, you did that to me. You didn't do it to me. Point being that what you are, you don't even know. You just be. You just know him and be. And God rewards you according to, I'm telling you, it's going to all be worth it. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, not work for the Lord, work of the Lord, with the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It's all going to be worth it. Man, it's powerful. We need to think that way. We really do. Hallelujah. Okay, so if any man amongst you, let him, let him be, become a fool that he may be wise, is the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Gentile here in Ephesians 4, 17, is talking about someone who was a non-Jew, someone outside of God's covenant, like any person today who has yet to commit their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is out of your heart that the issues of life flow. That's why Proverbs 4, 23, it's listed there. It says, keep or guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues, watch this, of life or the boundaries. You could literally translate that word issues, boundaries. The boundaries of your life flow from your heart. This is why I love what Dr. Jim Richards has a lot of great stuff on the heart zone, what he calls, he calls heart physics and working on your heart and changing the beliefs of your heart. A lot of times we just get information in the head, but we don't change the beliefs of our heart. And how does that come? Well, we need to meditate on the Word of God. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to show or see ourselves in the promises instead of the problem. Some of us have this vision on the inside of, of uh, well, it's always been this way. It's always been that we see ourselves sick. We see ourselves this way. See, that's, that's going to require more than just information. Informa correct information is important. But you've, we've got to change the beliefs of the heart, and we can do that. As we allow the Holy Spirit, as we spend time with Him, as we meditate and marinate in the promises he's, uh, that He's given us, as we speak forth what He says about us, as we declare in those areas, it takes effort. Now, some grace people think that's a cuss word. It's not. It's not effort to earn. Jesus earned it all, but the issue is my heart. Can my heart receive? Which brings me to, I've mentioned this verse many times, Proverbs chapter 17. Look at verse 20. This is amazing. Look at this. The froward heart, or he that hath a froward heart, he finds no good. The froward means, I told you before, it means twisted. Uh, our heart that bends the light. It's a heart that when light goes in, like a prism, it bends the light rays and they come out green and purple and all these other things. That's what it's saying. People hear things and, they, and the light rays come in and they bend the light rays. You know you even attract people, of like, like people attract. You can have two like people in a, in a room many times and they'll end up meeting each other. They'll end up uh, attracted to each other. This is why, once again, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to work on our heart because with the heart, Romans 10.10, 10, we believe into salvation, which isn't just being born again and going to heaven and missing hell. That's just one part of it. It's all the benefits that, got, that are available in Christ. With the heart, we believe into that, and then with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Amen? You know, Jesus warned of vain repetition in Matthew chapter 6. Not, not necessarily repetition, because the elders in Revelation 4 are around the throne saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And I can assure you that's not vain. Because it's just exploding out of who they are. Amen? That's different. But some people get this idea, and they, they get these, well, I'm just going to say it so many times, because that's what I heard the preacher say. And they, they miss the heart of the whole thing. And they start doing what I call the charismatic rosary. You know, I'll just say it so many times. But, but, but here again, it's it, heart belief. All right, moving right along. So look at this. Proverbs 17, verse 20 says, uh, uh, He that hath a heart that twists the light, I'm going to give you my paraphrase, he finds no good. Did you catch that? He finds no good. Wow. And he that hath a perverse tongue falls into mischief or evil. A perverse tongue. Froward heart, perverse tongue. Twisted heart, a heart that twists the light, results in a tongue that twists the truth. Man, that's good. 
All right, moving right along. And so, so um, most Christians are living like people who don't know God and wonder why they're getting the same results. Once again, Amos 3.3, can two walk together except they be in agreement? We can't, you know, God loves you if you watch Roadrunner all day. But don't be surprised if you start believing God and start trying to confess the word and all that comes out is beep, beep. You hear, you hear what I'm trying to say? What you put in. People don't understand this. I was telling my wife today, I believe, I mean, I, I make myself. Listen, where's the camera? <laughs> I make myself spend time praying in tongues every day, meditating the word. I do. Call it what you will, but I, I just know that I need discipline. And I know flesh, with, flesh takes the path of least resistance. And I just know how important it is. I'm sowing seeds. What if the farmer said, well, you know, yeah, I'll get to it, maybe. Yeah, I'll get to it. I, if God wants it done, we'll, we'll plant the field. You know, yeah, if God wants it done and God's in control, if he wants me to get a crop this year, he'll plant the seed for me. It never works. I plant the seed. I will pray with the spirit. I will pray with the understanding. I will meditate the word. And I literally do. I put, I put, uh, I make myself. But you know what? It, I know if for some reason I don't get to it, God's not mad at me. God's not rejecting me. God doesn't love me more, but I'll love him more because I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to teach me how much he loves me. Hear the difference? We need this because there's a lot of nitwit stuff being taught in the name of grace and it's not grace. It's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Jude, verses 3 and 4. That's in verse 4. It's crazy. We need to respond and, and, and once again say, well, I just want this to happen. I, I just want to be able to run a marathon. I don't have to train. That's legalism. Really. Try to run a marathon without training. Try to run one with training. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not doing it. That's too far. But my point in saying that is you've got the Bible. Well, let me show it. To, well, I'll just tell you. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, it talks about, verse 7, I believe it is, 6 and 7. It says, exercise yourself unto godliness. Train yourself. In fact, let me read it to you from the Amplified because it's really good. I just happen to have the Amplified here tonight. That's good. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, because I know in the Amplified it's really, really rock and roll. Um, it says, and da, 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 da. yeah, here we go, verse 7 and 8. But refuse and avoid irreverent legends, profane and impure and godless fictions, mere grandmother's tales and silly myths, and express your disapproval of them. Watch this. Train yourself toward godliness. Piety. Keeping yourself spiritually fit. I love this. Verse 8. For physical training is of some value, useful for a little. We need to take care of our temple, right? But godliness, spiritual training, is useful and of value in everything and in every way, for it holds promise for the present life and also for the life which is to come. That rocks. Thank you, Jesus. Whoops. All right. Thank you for having the Amplified out here tonight. That's good. Now, look, so most Christians are living like people who don't know God, and they are getting the same results. If you think like a lost person, you'll get lost person results. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Look at this one. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 15. <clears throat> Hebrews eleven fifteen, 15, where it talks about, and truly, if they had been mindful of the country from which they came out, the children of Israel left Egypt, they might have had, uh, from whence they came out, they may have had opportunity to return. In other words, what your mind is full of, that's where you're, where the mind goes, the man follows. Or the woman. All right. Uh, uh, if you start thinking like a new creation, you'll get spiritual results. Now, jump over. I was, man, I was really meditating on Romans 8 today. And boy, was it awesome. I'm seeing some things in this chapter, so I'm going to try not to go too long here. But there's really blessed me. At least the first part of it up to about verse 16, or no, about it, verse 18 is where I was at today. But it was so good. But look at this, Romans chapter 8, verse 6. Watch this. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now he is talking to believers. Remember that. And it goes on and says, because the carnal or the sense dominated mind is enmity, it's host hostility against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, <laughs> watch this, they that are in the flesh, uh, 
excuse me, they that cannot please God, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, we always stop there and we think that getting in the flesh, <coughs> excuse me, is just having a bad moment. But Paul's trying to get us to see as a believer, as a Christian, my position in Christ. Because the next verse says, but you are not in the flesh as a Christian, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. If you're born again, you're not in the flesh. Can you walk like you're in the flesh? Absolutely. But he's saying you're not in the flesh if you're born again, if the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of God, he is none of his. Now, I know there are people that profess Christ that aren't born again. But most, there's a lot of people that profess Christ that they walk like the unregenerate, like it said over in Ephesians chapter 4. Don't walk like the, the Gentiles, like the nations walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. It goes on and says in Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. Now look at this, it's it so good. But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his or he doesn't belong to him. Now watch this. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now what does that mean? Does that mean my body's what physically dead? No. That doesn't mean that at all. He's giving you God's assessment. Dead here means unplugged from God. Okay? When it's, it's the same Greek word, nekros, that's used in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Nekros. You were unplugged from God. You were a walking corpse, physically alive, but unplugged from God. And it says, look at this. It says, And if Christ be in you, the body. See, so many people are relating to God based on how they feel instead of what the Word says. Amen? I, there's people, I was going to do a, a, um, a post and said, weird is not a fruit of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit is not a, not a spiritual basket case. Amen. That's good stuff. Hallelujah. I, I've seen some, I'm moving right along, I'm going to be nice. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But watch this, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So what's that talking about? The Holy Spirit or your born again spirit? Your born again spirit. I know it's capitalized there, but the Greek word pneuma, you can only tell by the context. The Holy Spirit is mentioned here. For example, verse 16, when it says, His Spirit bears witness with our spirit. There you see both. The Holy Spirit bears witness through our born again spirit. That's how we relate to God. It's, this, is, this is so good. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life, zoe, because of righteousness. Verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. What is he saying? The life, the power to live the Christian life comes from within. The Holy Spirit, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. 1 Corinthians six seventeen. that's the power plant. And there's just so much good here. I've been meditating. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, not to my own strength. I, I don't owe the, the body. I don't owe, I don't have to go that way. But uh, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, to live trying to live the Christian life in my own strength. But for if, if you live after the flesh or your own strength, you shall die. What does that mean? You won't experience the abundant life that we have in Christ. And so many people, we you know, people get, I see people get born again, they get zealous, they're zealous for God, they're young, they're excited, and immediately they're trying to figure out what they're supposed to do for the Lord. Find out what He did for you. Major on that. Get in your lane of preparation, and He'll promote you when you're ready. So many people doing the work of the Lord, and they're not ready. Some, I've seen many among Christian TV, they're teaching crazy stuff. And people don't know the difference and they think, well, it's got to be God. They're on TV. Well, can I refer you to a lot of the fake news we're hearing today? <laughs> They're on TV too. <laughs> All right. It says, for if you live after the flesh, your own strength, you shall die. Not ex you'll, you'll operate unplugged from God. You'll op uh, uh, alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that, that is in that type of person. But if you through the Spirit, now I believe this is the Holy Spirit empowering your born again spirit. So, because they're one, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. But if you through the Spirit from the inside out, you do mortify the deeds of the body. You don't allow the body to lead you. 
you shall live or experience the life of God. And then it goes on and says, for as many as are led of the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. It's all good. But i got to move on or we will camp at Romans 8 because it's so good. All right, if you, where am I at here? Okay, if you start thinking uh, like a new creation, you'll get spiritual results. Go to Romans 12. That's in your outline. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. You know these verses where we've talked about them. I beseech you, I implore you, I beg you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Watch this. And be not conformed to this world or this age. Don't allow this age to cram you and squeeze you into its mold. That's what it's saying. But be transformed. Be transformed. Be metamorphosed. This is the, it, where we get our word metamorphosis, our English word, like a caterpillar to a butterfly. How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, renew your mind to who you are in Christ. How do you do that? Get in the word. I'm telling you, meditation, one of the definitions is sustained concentration. In the Hebrew word can mean mutter. We'll get into that in a little bit. But, but it's sustained concentration. And I'm telling you, you and I are equipped to do that. I've found many times people will try to overcome temptation to do wrong or whatever by trying to not think about that temptation. You know what the key is? It's just like when I get a dumb song in my head. You know, and I'm back there singing some who knows what from the days. I mean, I'll have songs come up in my head. I'll think, well, that's a flashback. Or somebody will say something about some song that was like, Wow, I never haven't thought about that song in years. And some of them have some pretty negative lyrics as far as faith is concerned. But rather than try to get that song out of my head, I've learned I've got to repra replace it with a good Christian song. Waymaker, miracle. You know, there's other stuff you can put in there because that it gets going in your head. But see, that's the way it is with negative thoughts. And, you know, you, we can do this, but we got to get the word in us. And the Holy Spirit will start quickening the word and we'll start getting revelation knowledge and he'll show us and he'll give us stuff and things will open up. It's powerful. Amen. People don't realize how powerful God's word is. Amen. You want to see Jesus, you see him in the word. And I think of Psalm 119 verse 162. It says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great spoil or treasure. Spoil the old King James, treasure the new King James. Same thing. Think about that. How many people rejoice at God's word as someone who has found great treasure? We're always looking. Ooh, just got a revelation. Just got a revelation. I said it earlier. Proverbs 17, 24. Wisdom is before him that has understanding of this great treasure. But the eyes of a fool are always looking out there for what he's got right here. Woo, that's good. Holy Spirit, thank you. All right, it says this. But if you do walk in the vanity of your mind, it darkens your understanding according to Ephesians 4.18. If you are living from your natural mind, what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel, and how you process that information um, in your little peanut brain in your head, you're going to, to uh, severely limit what God can do. God is so much bigger than any of us. And, and God's plans are, I'm telling you, they're so much bigger than us. I was telling Jen, I have certain things that I'm believing for, and, and, and I, I have like some pictures that I take with me sometimes. I don't have them with me now. And, and it's just stuff that I'm believing for. And, and, and I, I said, I don't have to do this, but I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to because I keep seeing myself in where I, where God, what God's doing. I keep seeing it and help get out of this little thinking. God's not little, and He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think, but it's according to something, according to the power that's working in us. And that's my part, to allow that power to work in me. And that whole prayer is powerful there in Ephesians chapter 3. That's verse 20. All right. It says, uh, when your heart becomes hardened, cold and sensitive, unfeeling and unyielding to God, it still functions, but it automatically becomes sensitive toward physical, natural, flesh-orientated types of things. This is why when we use the word sensitive, how many of you know our society is awfully sensitive? I mean, like sick sensitive. You know, now they're changing the names of these football teams and baseball teams. Let's, let's take another stupid steroid. Sorry, your mom's not here. <laughs> but, uh, but it's ridiculous. And, and, and you know, uh, well, I'm not even going to say it. <laughs> Well, maybe I will. It's funny. Uh, 
President Trump had a tweet out. I thought it was hilarious. And he was talking about a storied franchise like the Washington Redskins and the Cleveland Indians supposedly changing their name and how it's, 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 a, it's a reference of strength. It's not meant as an insult or any kind of racial thing. And, and, and he said, and then he had down there, he said, man, I bet Indians like Elizabeth Warren are really upset now. <laughs> That's funny. I don't care who you are. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, I mean, I just marvel at the magnitude of stupidity in our society. And here's why. When you kick God out, when God's not a part of your processes, the way of man's not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his steps, Jeremiah 10, 23 tells us. And, and seriously, people can become, people say, is it demonic? Is it fleshly? Yes, both. Well, you know, because sometimes the devil doesn't have to work very hard because people are already started on stupid and they just keep going down that path and it gets worse, deceiving and being deceived. Second Timothy 3, 13. Now watch this. Um, uh, so when, when, you, when your heart becomes hardened, cold and sensitive, unfeeling and unyielding to God, it functions, but it automatically becomes sensitive uh, toward uh, physical, natural, flesh-orientated types of things. In other words, it, all, it, it goes down if you, if you don't allow it, you know, focus on the right things. Well, I was just looking at some of my notes here. They're good. Worry, fear, and unbelief, and anger all come out of the heart. Matthew 15, 19. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Uh, Mark chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceits, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. There's a lot of things we're skipping because we've got to make time here. God is transmitting and speaking to you, but you don't hear because your heart is insensitive. We must train our heart to reign. Let me show it to you. Very familiar verses to many of you. Look at Proverbs chapter number 3. Look at this. This is so good, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something. Proverbs chapter number 3, look at verses 5 and 6. Familiar passages. Trust in the Lord with all your head, all thine heart, and lean not under your own understanding. Now stop. Meditate on that. That's amazing. You know, then, then you know what happens? In all your ways, he talks about in all your ways, how many of your ways? All your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Now think about this. All your ways, if you, the word acknowledge is not a head nod. It's the Hebrew word yada, Y-A-D-A. And it's the same word that's used in Genesis chapter 4, right at verse 1, when it talks about Adam knew Eve and she conceived, yada. How many know Adam's knowing of Eve was not a handshake or a elbow bump because of the coronavirus? <laughs> sarcasm intended okay right it was it was intimacy in all your ways acknowledge him yada and he was promised to direct your path but it starts with trusting God with all your heart and that's a conscious choice that I can't do that no but you can be the Holy Spirit can do it through you if you just say yeah I tell people this if you're willing to be willing God can do it I realize that without him, I can't do anything. Jesus said that in John chapter 15. I believe it's verse 5. But with him, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, Philippians 4, 13. Isn't that something? See, it's good to realize you're nothing in yourself because that allows, you can glory in your weakness and it allows his strength to tabernacle you. Some people get so bummed, oh, I'm weak. Yeah, you're just fine. Praise God, you're seeing it. You've always been weak in yourself. Now you can allow his power, his strength to tabernacle you. That's why Paul said, man, I'm going to glory in my weaknesses because when I'm weak, I'm strong because he's strong in me. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 10, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Not be strong in Chris and what he thinks, he, how strong he is. That's the world's mindset. People act like, you know, I remember when that no fear thing came out. Remember that see, thing you see people wear? I thought it was a Christian thing. This been years ago, I remember seeing say, no fear. I go, wow, is that a Christian shirt? No. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was. But I, hey, it was a conversation piece. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Your heart becomes sensitive to whatever you focus your attention on, and your heart becomes hardened to whatever you neglect. Amen. I'm going to do this quick, but go to Matthew 6. I'm, I didn't, this is... There's a lot of good verses here that are just awesome that I've written down that are just so good. Matthew chapter 6, and look at verse 21. It's just so good. 
I'm just going to just hit 21. I wanted to do more, but where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, for years, I looked at that and thought, man, I can't help it. Whatever, whatever I'm treasuring, that's where my heart's at. I can't help it. But what he's saying, and I'm going to, he's saying what you treasure, that's where your heart will go. Whatever you focus on, give your attention to, that's where your heart will go. Whatever you neglect, that's where your heart will not go. Amen? Well, I'm having a problem with nightmares. Well, what do, you, what do you watch? Oh, we watch horror movies. Hmm, could there be a connection? <laughs> there is. Don't waste your time with that nonsense. All right. Okay. If you glorify and thank God, your imagination will start seeing godly things instead of the negative. Go to Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. Watch this. If you will glorify and thank God with your mouth, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Psalm 34 verse 1. So if we glorify and thank God, your imagination will start seeing godly things instead of the negative. Jeremiah 17. Look at verses 5 through 8. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departs from the Lord. Wow. How does his heart depart from the Lord? He starts trusting in men. And that man can be himself or herself. Amen? Look at this. What's he going to be like? What's going to be the fruit of that? Look at verse 6. For he shall be like a heath, a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when good comes. Even when good comes, he or she won't see it. You ever seen somebody like that? It don't matter what it is, it's bad. <laughs> Look at that. He shall be like a heath or a shrub in the desert, shall not see when good cometh. He shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness. Wow. In a salt land and not inhabited. In other words, it's never going to be right. Hallelujah. Look at the next two verses because this is us in Jesus' name. Blessed is the man or woman who trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. We're blessed. This person is going to be like a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat comes. It didn't say it when comes that he's not going to see it. That does, I don't think that means he or she's ignorant of it. They're just not going to see it. It's not going to affect them. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God in activity in their life. Look at this. And not see when he cometh, but, shall, but her, leaf, her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought or, or anxious or worrisome. The Amplified brings that out real good. He, this person shall not be worrisome. Why? Because they're trusting the Lord. In the year of drought, this person shall not be worrisome in a pandemic. Amen. Why? Because they're trusting the Lord. God's got this because they're, they're intentionally putting their trust in, in Him. Neither shall they cease from yielding fruit. Wow. What a contrast between someone who trusts in themselves or others and someone who trusts in the Lord. That's amazing. Okay, so if we glorify and thank God, our imagination will start seeing godly things instead of the negative. If you don't want something birthed in you, don't think it. Every man is tempted, James chapter 1 tells us, and drawn away of his own lust. Lust, when it hath conceived, brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished or allowed to run its course, brings forth death. You can read James chapter 1, verse 13, 14, and 15, because it starts out saying, Let no man say when he's tempted or tried or tested, that I'm tempted or tried and tested of God. Yet you got some people teaching it. Craziness. I'm glad God's good. All right. You can't allow your imagination to follow a train of thought that is contrary to God's word. If you want God's results, you cannot allow your imagination to follow a train of thought that is contrary to God's word. Now, jump over to 1 Timothy. This is ready. This is going to be good. Hang on. Fasten your seatbelts. 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 13. We'll start there. It says, Till I come, Paul speaking, give attendance to three things. To reading, the reading of the word. It can be the public reading. I believe individual reading. We need to read the word. Amen? Reading to exhortation, paraclesis, to calling near. We realize that if we're here seeing the gospel, I got, if, we're pre, if the word is gospel to us and we're seeing it as gospel, it gets into us. Boy, I want to go somewhere. We just don't have time. <laughs> Reading to exhortation and to doctrine. Now watch this. Neglect not the gift which is in thee, which was given thee by, the, by prophecy with the laying on the hands of the presbytery. Neglect not, which means to, I believe this is referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can argue with me. I don't have time to prove it. That's okay. You can be wrong and I'll be right. 
It means it neglect not this charisma, which means to not think about and thus not respond appropriately. That's why I constantly remind you, because he constantly reminds me. And then it says, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, your entire being. The same way our bodies are immersed in air, that's how we need to be immersed in the things of God, the Word of God. Meditate upon these. Give thyself wholly unto them that thy profiting or thy progress may appear to all. Now watch this. The word meditate is meliteo. And, and this word, I'm going to show you something. Hang on, we're going to take a trip here. It's a present tense verse. Continually do this. It's in the imperative mood, which means it's a command. Don't forget this. It's, I'm not, this is not optional. Meditate in these things. The Holy Spirit says these things because he loves us. This is, God's correction is never rejection. It's protection from taking a wrong path. And this whole world lies in wickedness, right? There's constantly wrong paths. Now remember that word meliteo. I'm going to take you over to Acts chapter 4. I'm going to show you this word again. We're going to go back to Psalms too. Hang on. Acts chapter 4, same Greek word. Used three times in the New Testament. Here's the second time. Acts chapter 4, verse 25. Watch this. Hang with me. Acts chapter 4. Look at this. Ah, what did I say? 425. Who by the mouth of David, watch this, thy servant, look at this, who by the mouth of David thy servant has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? There that word meditate is translated imagine in the King James, Acts 425. And it's he's quoting from Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. Melateo. Remember that. Now go back to Acts 2. Let me show you this. That's where the that's what's being quoted from here in Acts chapter 4, verse 25. I know this, hang with me because this is really good. Acts chapter, uh, excuse me, Psalm chapter 2, verse 1, and this is a, where he's quoting from in Acts 4, 25. Look at this. And it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people, there it is, imagine a vain thing? Now, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, right? And there we just saw Melateo quoted in in Acts 4.25, and also spoken of in 1 Timothy chapter 4, when it talks about meditate upon these things. And here is the word Hagah. This is the Hebrew word. This is the same word that's used in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, where it says meditate upon these things. I'm sorry. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy heart, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Hagah. Same word that's used here. It's also used right here in Psalm chapter 1, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he haga, meditate day and night. You can see the connection. This is that sustained concentration on the Word of God. This is where you make it a practice, a habit of meditating the Word of God. When it says those who by reason of use or habit have their senses trained, they're constantly meditating in the Word of God. The Word of God will consume you if you will allow the Holy Spirit to do that. If you will give yourself to Him. That's what it means when you, I, you know, I beseech you that you give your, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, living sacrifice. You offer it on, on the altar of God's Word and God, the consuming fire, He'll consume you, but He'll consume your fears. He'll consume your strife. He'll consume your sickness. He'll, that's what His fire burns up and it releases the joy of the Lord. Whew, glory to God. I know that was kind of a heady ride, but, but there's a lot there if you want to meditate on it. If you'll do these things, you'll find it will sensitize your heart toward the Lord. I value peace highly. We talked about it earlier. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Colossians 3.15 The peace of God is an umpire. Call situations safe or out. You could literally say, let the peace of God umpire in your hearts. Whew, I love that. If anything starts making me anxious and upset, I change whatever is going on in my life in a hurry. How? You change your focus. Doesn't mean you ignore your responsibilities, but you bring, you know, you, you keep your focus on the Lord. God has said, God has called us to meditate no matter what we're doing. We're always meditating, whether you realize it or not. I believe a lot of people walk around, and I have to fight this like everyone, with lazy brain. You know, and, and, and they, they just, we need to gird up the loins of our mind, which means in 1 Peter 1, 13, we need to stop allowing our, our minds to drag the ground of this fallen world. We need to gird them up. We need to have promises. Man, take three by fives, whatever you got to do to, to, you know, buffet your body. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 26 and 27 talks about, Paul said, I, 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 bring, I keep it under. I don't let it run me, I, which means I, I'm not sense led. I'm not body ruled. I'm spirit ruled. 
See, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, Galatians 5 tells us. But people say, well, just don't fulfill the lust of the flesh and you'll be walking in the Spirit. That's wrong. Romans 13 verse 14 says, put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. The word provision is forethought. Isn't that amazing? If you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, you won't make forethought for the flesh. We make forethought for the flesh because we don't realize we've put on Jesus. Or we're, you know, we're born again, we've done that positionally, but we need to do that on a conscious, everyday basis. Not because God's going to reject us, because He's trying to protect us and He loves us. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Uh, if, any, uh, if, if you don't know how to walk in peace, you'll be stressed out no matter what the situation is. Boy, isn't that the truth? How, I, I was telling the Lord a while back, I was saying, you know, I just... Hey, you almost feel like if, if you, you're almost afraid to not be afraid. Does that make any sense? You, you're like, well, if, I got to have some fear going because you don't want to be too happy. And I'm thinking this ain't right. You know, I'm not saying I'm there, but I'm saying I see it. And God doesn't want us to walk there. And I think, Lord, is, how do you do that? Well, I can't do that, but he can. Lord, I can't not have some fear going on. You're going to have to help me with this. He will. See, glory in my weakness. The very fact that you realize you can't do it is a good thing. Because now you can depend on him to do it through you. Amen. Hallelujah. If you truly are in a bad situation that's stealing your peace, you need to change that situation. As a born-again believer, you have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16 Put on the new man, which uh, your spirit man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Colossians 3.10 It's your spirit, not your brain, that knows all things. I quoted it earlier. 1 John 2.20 but you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. We have this tremendous presence of God in our hearts, but most of us are not listening. Whew. Go to Proverbs 4. I'm going to try to do, I've got several verses I wrote down here that I think will bless you. Proverbs chapter 4, I want to show you some things in Proverbs. I'm going to do this quick, so bear with me because I want to get it in. My son, Proverbs 4 verse 20. My son, attend to my words, incline your ear unto my sayings bend your ear to my sayings pay attention watch this verse 21 let them not depart from your eyes keep them in the midst of thine heart wow but it starts with hearing for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh look at this isaiah 55 this is a good one watch this one isaiah 55 and look at verse Two and three. Wherefore, or why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself. O King James says fatness, but it means just in the profuseness of spiritual joy is what the Amplified says. Incline your ear. This is what I'm after. Verse three. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. Flip side. Don't hear. And your soul won't live. Doesn't mean you won't die and go to heaven. In fact, you could go earlier. But it says, Here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. But that's the key. Here and your soul shall live. Since you're in Isaiah, jump back to chapter 50. Look at verse 4. The Lord God have given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth me morning by morning. He wakens my ear to hear as the learned. Isaiah 50 verse 4. Proverbs 20 verse 12 says, The hearing ear and the seeing eye the Lord has made each of them. And over here in 1 Kings chapter 3, remember when Solomon, you know, when he had, um, when he asked, God said, ask me anything. You know, and, and he asked for an for a understanding heart. I'm going to show it to you. 1 uh, Kings chapter 3. He's, and here's what he asked for. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge this uh, uh, thy so great a people. Give me an understanding heart. And boy, this really pleased God. But you know what understanding is? A hearing heart. That's what it is in the Hebrew. Give me a hearing heart. Amen. Give me a, you could say it this way. Give me a heart that's sensitive to your voice. Well, that's a prayer we all need. Amen. Now, one more. Oh, probably not. I'm seeing how much we got here. I wanted to do Proverbs 8, but we're not going to do that right now. If you don't get to the place where you honestly trust your heart more than your head, you're never going to become a successful Christian. Wow. 
Let me say it, read that again. If you don't get to the place where you honestly trust your heart more than your head, you'll never, you're never going to become a successful Christian. Wow. That's where God's Spirit leads. He leads you and I through the Spirit, which is our inner man, our heart, our entire inner man, our spirit, and our soul. My son, here it is, we talked about it, Proverbs 4, 21 and 22. My son, attend to my words, incline your ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my head. No, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. For, that, for they, God's words, are life unto those that find them. We just read this out of Proverbs 4. And health to all their flesh. Keep, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues or the boundaries of your life. Remember Psalm 78, 41, how they limited God, they limited the Holy One of Israel? Think about that. We can do that because God leaves it up to us how much, you know, He's not going to force Himself on us. He loves us. That's amazing. All right. Life comes from your heart, not your mind or external things. It takes time to meditate and give all diligence to your heart. Be still, know that I am God. It says in Psalm 46, verse 10, you have to start spending time in God's presence, listening to your heart, paying attention to the Lord speaking to you. There's just no shortcut to it. One more, I got two minutes. Two minutes. Go to, I was going to try to get this one in. We've skipped a lot, but it's all good. I've wrote down a lot of scriptures, but really good stuff. Proverbs chapter 8, I'll do this quick, real, real quick, and you'll just have to... Look it up at your, your leisure. That's Singaporean for leisure. That's Joseph Princess leisure. <laughs> Look it up at your leisure. <laughs> it's funny how people talk. All right. Proverbs chapter 8, he's talking about wisdom. Doth not wisdom cry? Understanding put forth her voice. It's powerful. But you get all the way down to verse 33. And I'm just going to close out with this. It says, hear instruction. That word instruction means discipline, chastening, correction. Hear it. Proverbs 4.13 says it's your life and be, not, and be wise and refuse it not. Now watch this, verse 34. Blessed is the man or woman that hears me. Wisdom, the wisdom of God. Jesus is made into his wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. So blessed is the man that hears me. He's sensitive to God's promptings, his leading. He's sensitive to the word, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my door watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my door. He has a relationship. It's ongoing. I think of the bond servant. You know it in Exodus chapter 21. It says, man, they could go free. And he says, man, I love my master. I want to stay. And, you know, they put the, the all through the earlobe or whatever, and they, they, they're a bond That's what Paul was. I'm a bond servant to Christ. But so blessed is that person. Now look at this. For whoso findeth me, he finds life. And shall obtain favor of the Lord, the wisdom of God. But he that sinneth against me wrongs his own soul. All they that hate me. Now the word hate in scripture doesn't mean active aggression. It can include that, but it's not just that. It just means to renounce one choice in favor of another. It means if you hate something, you refuse to align yourself with it. Now it can be detest and all those other things, but it says, but he that sins against the wisdom of God by not hearing, not being sensitive, watch this, wrongs his own soul. God's not doing it. All they that refuse to align themselves with the wisdom of God and being sensitive to the spirit of God, the Amplified Bible says they love and court death. They're dating death. They're de wow. See, God doesn't put these things in there because he's trying to be mean. Proverbs 13, 13, and this is the last one. Proverbs 13, 13, I just want to give it to you. I've talked about it before. Whoso despises the word shall be destroyed. Now the word despises there means to regard it as insignificant. See, this isn't God doing these things. This is God lovingly telling. The world's full of landmines. 1 John 5, 19, the whole thing lies in wickedness. That verse says, but you know that you're of God. Do you know you're of God? Do you know you're out of God? Do you know you're a child of God? Look at this. Whoso regards the word as insignificant shall be destroyed. Watch this. Uh, but he that feareth or reveres the commandment, the word of God, shall be rewarded. If you're a diligent seeker of God, man, I'm telling you, you're, you're walking in blessing, blessing, blessing. Your blessing's available to you whether you walk in it or not. God's not rejecting any of us based on our performance because it's based on Jesus. 
But we have to agree with that. That's why our part is faith, believing in what he did. And out of that, we're sensitive to the spirit of God and the promptings of God. He will lead us in the blessing. It isn't, well, I put faith in Jesus. Now I'm going to live my life on my own. We keep putting faith in Jesus. That's why Jesus said, abide in him. And that's what the spirit of God does. He makes us sensitive to his promptings that guide us into the truth of God's word. And that's where blessing's at. That no matter what your situation is, you are blessed. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray and I'll shut this thing down. Father, we thank you for your word. We love you. I decree sensitivity to the spirit of God in my life. Everyone that's listening here, you know, that'll listen later on, on uh, Facebook or wherever they listen on the website, however you listen, I decree that we are sensitive to God. Say that. Say, I am sensitive to the spirit of God in Jesus name. Blessings. Amen. Praise God. We done, Julie? You got it off? Nope. <laughs> oh, I thought it was off. Sorry. <laughs>